Welcome to Inside Healthcare. More than 100,000 people in America have died from an opiate overdose. Sadly, one of them is Josiah Kautz. His parents, Maria and Jason Kautz, are now sharing their story in a new original documentary by Emmy Award winning filmmaker Joe Carlini. Joining us, we're very pleased to have with us in the TV studios are Josiah's mom and dad, Maria and Jason. And then also joining us is Joe Carlini, the filmmaker. And you're here to tell us a little bit about your incredible son and why what happened to you, you said, can happen to any family. So really appreciate you taking time to be with us to share your story. So Josiah was your oldest of he your was. children? Yes. Tell us a little bit about him. He was our oldest son. He, from the time he was very young, in fact, I'll just tell you, at one years of age, he was completely potty trained day and night. He was very smart, straight A student. He was a jock. He played all sports. Um, very, very bright, made great decisions, never worried about him one day in our life. Even as a teenager, he was an excellent, excellent student, excellent son. Um, Jason has always been in politics. We come from a family who really cares. We were involved in our community and just living the American dream, honestly, raising our family. So you said if it could happen to you, what happened to your son could happen and to your family can happen to anyone. What did happen to Josiah? If you can share that with us. Sure. So at the age of 18, he graduated high school and he graduated with honors and he was off to college and he was a soccer player. So he was going to be a walk on on a college team. So we procured a apartment for him in, in Mesa and he started his year off of college. And again, just with all the, the brightest dreams in the world, bright future in front of him. And about three months after he started college, we had a report that he was in trouble. Um, of course, we didn't believe it because we, you know, there was no way our son was going to be in trouble in any way. We headed over to Mesa it, into his apartment and the first scene that I've ever experienced of anyone on drugs as we walked into his apartment that had been fully furnished by his dad and I, and it was completely empty. You had to be shocked and stunned. <clears throat> Very shocked. That this was your son. <clears throat> yeah. No, we, we <clears throat> didn't even expect any of that. We, you know, we, we thought that, uh, you know, come from a pretty decent home, we thought that he was going to, you know, succeed and just go on into whatever career he ever wanted to do. Because um, you could tell he, he wasn't, wasn't interested in construction and so he wanted to uh, spread his wings and and so yeah that's one of the re big reasons why we decided uh, to to uh, to do this documentary film was because you know we're the of the people that we don't just lift up the rug and sweep everything underneath it um, our lives are exposed because I'm I'm in the public eye you're and the mayor uh, of your town I'm the mayor of our city yes and so People are constantly watching us, and so um, I always wanted to make sure that everybody knew the truth about us and stuff, and, and it, it hurts. It hurts, but um, Maria received that phone call from, from the director. Wow, and then it, it was a long journey, right? It, it never ended. So we showed up at his apartment, and it was completely empty, and don't worry, mom and dad are here to save the day. Because uh, remember, we knew nothing about drugs. And so we took him home and I told him, you know, a brief couple weeks and just, just to get your head back on straight and you'll be right back to college. And five years later, we found him dead in his bedroom. It never quite turned around. He went to a couple rehabilitation centers. Um, he ended up doing very well at his third or fourth one and he met a girl that was from France and he got married and moved abroad and drugs were always at the forefront even of his marriage and he got clean but by then it was his marriage was over and he moved home and four short months later he was he was dead I, I just can't imagine I can't imagine what you and your family have gone through and and they are Many of the family members have talked in the, in the documentary. Joe, why don't you tell us about the, the documentary itself and why you decided to take on the, the documentary film? Sure, I think for me, I was in between projects and um, found out about their story. And to me, Maria wrote 
a few articles in their, their local paper and her writing was so good and it reeled me in as a reader. And I think she was so open and honest and truthful of their experience and, and really kind of candid and blunt that I, I, I think some part of me, it drew me in as a storyteller that I was like, this could be a documentary. Initially, I pitched it as like a four month deal, ended up being a lot longer and it kept getting bigger and, and you know, we've shot all over the country. Um, Chief Jan Rader, who we actually spoke with earlier today, she was in the movie Heroin, which was nominated for an Oscar. Um, it's on Netflix. We have her whole fire department in the film and experts kind of throughout. And why? Because they were a hotbed or the epicentric of Well, they the were kind of like, crisis? they kind of considered it being like the, um, I don't know, the, what do you, would you describe it? Maybe not the like the where it kind of started from, but they called it kind of the cap like the overdose capital of the country. So, yeah, just the project kept getting bigger. Um, her whole family, Maria, Maria and Jason's family, they they were so honest with their experience with Josiah. And I think you know, as a storyteller, um, I just I really connected with how real it was and how much pain there was. And I think for me, that's what my job was was to shed light on that. And the film holds nothing back. It really no. shows in-depth look at the opiate crisis from a family's perspective, from a community's perspective, from the country's perspective on what's happening. Right, and I think that's the thing that people need to realize. I think we've, we've kind of turned the corner on, you know, the taboo talking about, you know, drugs and heroin and opiates, and I think a lot of people that are from nicer communities or better communities when it comes to like crime or things of that nature think it's not a problem but I think the more naive you are the more you're going to realize how much of a problem it is when it's at your front door. Do you feel like Josiah is opening this up to the world about what it's like and, and getting that message across? Absolutely. About the dangers of it? Absolutely. It, it definitely is. You know when we very first found out that Josiah was on drugs I hadn't personally known one other family that suffered from this. No one talked about it. And it was such a lonely spot to be in. And of course, once you get involved in it and realize the shame that people have to face, you under, I understand it, but that didn't stop us from, because we wanna help others who don't know where to go, who have no idea who they can talk to, who, like Joe said, just sweep it under the carpet, that never helps because that's what ad addiction lives on that. Addiction lives on being hidden and being secret, whereas healing comes from connection and exposing and being in this together, locking arms with people and knowing that you're not alone being in the community. And you wrote about it in a book as well. I did, yes, yes I did. To share it, and that's one way that Joe learned about this, I believe, or yes. in the process. Yes. And then Jason, what what would be your message to families out there that may be suffering for, they have an um, opiate addiction in their family or them personally, what would you say to them? It's just <coughs> open communication. You know, you, I, it, to me, I think it's early education. I think that you, you need to start, yes. you need to start thinking that it can happen to you. It can happen to your family. And so have that, have that tough talk if you need to with your son or your daughter. Um, and really get inside and, and really <clears throat> just care and, and just get with them and, and open it up. I mean, we would have never, I, we thought you just didn't do that kind of stuff, you know. And, and um, so that was, that's where I would try to pinpoint it right to the earliest education you can. And the, the, the film has been shown in Arizona, in California, in Minnesota. You have a special screening here this week in, in Minnesota at a school with a two, four parents and students. Why was it important to bring that to students? I think ever, you know, even from the beginning of this whole process, I think we mentioned the idea of, you know, showing it at schools. You know, I mean, the film to me is still early on within where it can go and I think this was kind of the first school that's really kind of promoted by the high school I mean it's it's kind of students and and parents are allowed to come and it's a free screening and you know we're gonna have a Q&A after the screening and just inform people I feel like people need to be informed of the reality of of what what's going on with opiates with fentanyl with heroin you know how you know one night 
of a bad decision could lead to your life just spiraling out of control to where, you know, you end up dying. And I think that's just where we are as a society. The, you have to really accept where, um, what this epidemic has been and where it's gone. And, and I think the way you combat it and really kind of turn the corner is having an open dialogue and conversation and, you know, educating students at a young age. And for us, you know, with Maria, we, we didn't help hold anything back. I mean, we, we do show the overdose photos of Josiah, which are pretty disturbing. And I asked her, are you sure you want to do this? Because it's very, I mean, it doesn't hold anything back. It's very private. It's very, you know, kind of for their family. And, and she said, if we can save one life, you know, that's, that's why we're doing this. And to me, those images are needed for the film because I think a student, you know, or a kid that's 14, 15 years old, they see these images, they're like, I don't want to be that person. I don't want that to be me. I don't want my family to go through this heartbreak. And I think that's really the ultimate goal of Josiah is to save lives. Final comment to our viewers. To say one life saved is worth it all. Absolutely. Really a pleasure to have you on the show. And thank you for taking time to be with us. So thank, thank you. you so thank much. You. Thank you. Really Thanks. appreciate it. Up next, a local doctor has some advice for parents on kids and anxiety during the new school year. So stay with us. You're not going to get it all right. Just make sure you nail the big stuff, like making sure your kids are in the right seat for their age and size. Get it right at NHTSA.gov slash the right seat. State and national health officials say that many kids of all ages are struggling right now with anxiety, stress, and depression since the start of the new school year. Joining us, we're glad to have back with us Dr. Lewis Seidner with M Health Fairview. So thank you for being with us. Thank you. What are some of the issues? What is going on? I mean, as, as I mentioned before we started, I've been hearing that lots of students are having a hard time right now. Well, certainly there's a lot of stress. Uh, I think there's always been a lot of stress for students. Adolescence is a time of stress, lots of changes, lots of developmental uh, elements. And then you add to that the fact that we've been in a pandemic for a couple of years. School has been off and on at times. People have been more isolated than they typically are. Uh, even families at times don't get together because of the pandemic. And so people have felt more isolated and that's one of the triggers for symptoms of, of mental health. And as you said, it um, it's not unusual, new school year, students have a lot of stress and anxiety, but even right. more so now. And is it because the, the COVID is still with us and we're still seeing that health uh, issues? Certainly COVID is an issue. And I think the uncertainty of our health, the uncertainty of where it's safe to go with a mask, without a mask, all of the questions that have, have come up with that. Is there a new variant? Will I catch the variant? What's the consequence? Uh, but I think there's also a lot of other things going on in our world, and all of those together uh, add to a stressful situation in combination with a time of life that's particularly stressful. For and it's right kids. on their, their mobile, their iPhones, and it's right sure. there with them all the time. Yeah, it's hard to separate from what's going on in our communities, our world, uh, and everything in between. What type of um, symptoms and things are they exhibiting someone who might be experiencing the stress, anxiety, or depression? Sure. I know it's different for different things, but. It is, and I think what's important to understand is that we all have some of those symptoms. Um, we all have times when we're anxious. We all have times when we're sad, other times when we're less sad and less anxious. So we're all on a continuum. And when we talk about it as being problematic, it's when it impacts someone's ability to do the things they enjoy and to do their normal activities, going to school in the case of a student, uh, having after school activities, having friendships, having interaction with family. Those are normal things to do. And when those symptoms get so significant that it impacts their abilities to do those things, that's when we talk about it as needing some form of intervention. How do you know at what point then they need either from a school counselor to more professional medical help and stuff like that. Right. Well, we are very appreciative of the school and the school counselors and the observations of school professionals. 
Uh, that's probably one of the biggest elements that was missing through COVID are the observations of objective parties in, in the school, people who know kids and appreciate the changes in them. Uh, so that has been a significant challenge while schools were closed or while schools had staffing challenges um, to, to do that. I think part of it is know your child uh, and know when the symptoms are no longer just a bad day, uh, just a tough you know, interaction with friends, but really are causing more significant problems and more protracted problems uh, when they're struggling. Um, we've seen students who were relatively good students, not perfect, but, but good students, suddenly having much more troubles with their classes or folks who enjoyed uh, playing sports or playing an instrument or being part of other activities no longer having any interest. When those things start to show a pattern, not just a day I don't want to go, but a pattern over time of just lose, losing interest, uh, being more uh, anxious and more isolative, those are times really to start to seek some help. And we're talking about kids of all ages, all backgrounds, the whole... Uh, right. It, it's... Equal opportunity. Equal opportunity, that's the word I was looking for. Yeah. yeah. It's all children, um, you know, every child, every person is on a continuum. Some children struggle more, some struggle less, uh, but particularly through the last two and a half years or so, I think we've all struggled a little more than we did prior. And so children who maybe had more potential for struggling may be really struggling now, uh, but even children who may not have been struggling are now struggling a bit. And what type of help is available? What does M Health Fairview offer? You know, I think there's all kinds of, of, of uh, available services. The one that I would usually advocate starting with are school resources. You know, school resources are available uh, and, and you know, should be checked into uh, whenever feasible. Uh, additionally, there are many kinds of therapists in our community. Uh, M Health Fairview has a service that if you have a particular area that you're looking for, a particular type of service, we can help connect you with those, um, those services. You know, for some, it gets more significant. Um, one of the things that we always worry about are kids who feel hopeless. And sometimes as a result of that hopelessness, feel like life is not worth living uh, and potentially want to take their life or, or, or take risks that, that risk their life. And so we want to intervene quickly in those cases. And um, there's a new hotline number, I think, for suicide prevention, is. 988, mm -hmm. that is available 24-7 everywhere. It is. A and I think it's important that we take those kinds of thoughts seriously. Um, you know, it's not something you can just push through it oftentimes. And so um, I, I, I always stress, know your child pay attention to what's going on with your child. And, and this is true for adults too. So I, I know this is particularly about children, um, but I think mm -hmm. know your own uh, emotions and, and know where those edges are. Well, it's been a pleasure to have you back on the show with great information for our viewers. So thank you so much, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. When we come back, a young White Bear Lake man shares his personal story and his need for a new kidney. His story is next. Life doesn't always give you time to change the outcome. Prediabetes does. One in three adults has prediabetes, but with early diagnosis, prediabetes can be reversed. And you can change the outcome. Take the one minute prediabetes risk test today. Go to doihaveprediabetes.org. Joining us now is Nate Peranto, and he is from White Bear Lake, and he's an entrepreneur, and he has a pretty cool thing. He, he does um, handmade fishing rods and things like That's that. That's correct. And videos. Why don't you tell us about what you do, and, and thank you for being on the show. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. So, yeah, the, the company's called Delabay Custom Rods. It's uh, my best friend and I, Sam Guirelli. It's uh, ran out of his basement right now in Elk River, Minnesota. We hand make all kinds of fishing rods, specializing in, in high-end ice rods, and we do all kinds of open water rods too, like walleye rods and bass rods, obviously, that's what's 
popular here in Minnesota. So that's really cool. Is that something you dreamed about doing, or you just fell so into it? You guys. Sam started it. He he kind of was. Uh, we lived together in college, and he started making ice rods for fun, and it grew from there. And he asked um, if I wanted to help help him promote the business. So that's what I do is is uh, do all the social media and stuff like that, and make fishing videos and all kinds of uh, promotional stuff for us. So. That is awesome. And one of the reasons why you're with us, you've always been very healthy up until recently. Yes. Why don't you tell us about it's your kidney and doctors say that you need a new kidney. Yes, exactly. So last November uh, I was diagnosed with kidney failure. I found out very late in the game that I had kidney problems. I was at a, actually at an ice fishing show and um, on my feet all day and my lower legs swelled up really bad. So that was kind of alarming and I went into the doctor and, and got tested and he called me after I left and said I need to go to the ER because my kidneys were failing. So it was this really shocking, just kind of out of nowhere deal. I've been mm -hmm. really healthy my whole life, played sports growing up and was still playing men's league hockey up until last winter and then, yeah. It's uh, been quite a whirl whirlwind since since then. And um, I understand that you had some possible living kidney donors that um, worked out, almost worked out for you? Or? So as far as the kidney donation goes, they don't um, up update me with any of that information because it's because of HIPAA, and uh, so if I if there is um. someone that's going through that process, and they know me directly and tell me, that's the only way I'll know if someone's uh, going through that process. But there's been a few people going through that have made it pretty far, and then ended up not being a match. So I'm still sitting and waiting at this point that someone will waiting. eventually. And that's why it's important for everyone to think about registering to be a living kidney donor. Yeah, definitely. So um, I, don't, I don't know if you guys have the links um, for that information. I have it up on We can put that on, on the my, screen. Yeah, that'd And be what awesome. is that? So there's a link you can go online to just fill it out online if you'd like to do it that way, or there's a uh, phone number that goes directly to uh, my, my transplant coordinator. And they have all kinds of information for you as far as um, who's eligible and things like that. And it's pretty much anyone can donate any age and and things like that. I don't like to tell people the reasons why they can't donate. I'll let them uh, talk to the coordinator and find out if they're a match or not that way because mm -hmm. I guess that kind of uh, is an incentive for people at least check it out. And it has to certain, the match is different areas, right? That yeah, it has to do a lot with blood type is a big one and then there's a bunch of other uh, testings and, and things like that that I have to go through to see if it is. but. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of other questions that obviously pe people would have that the coordinator would have for them, but uh, as far as like payment and things like that go, my insurance would cover that, so mm -hmm. donors wouldn't have to pay anything out of their pocket. What else is involved with receiving a donor kidney and things like that? Um, well, another fun fact, Fun fact. that I learned about kidney donation is that when I receive a kidney, um, they so that my kidneys that are failing now, they just leave them in there and put the new one in. So I'd actually have three kidneys once I do receive that. New wow, one. you'll be very special. Then. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic. Wow. And um, if someone wants to use it, they can go to that site and they can see about registering and stuff like yep. that. Yeah, absolutely. They just go in there and fill out in, out the info, and then the coordinator will reach out to them with more information. So looking forward to the future, what are you hoping? Hoping to get a kidney and uh, turn this turn this around. It's been a tough tough year this last year, and then recently the last uh, I would say three four months or so, my legs have gotten super weak, which has limited me physically from doing a lot of things that I love to do, and even just daily tasks like getting up the stairs and things like that. So. Been working on physical therapy to try and get some strength back there, but once once I get a kidney, hopefully everything goes back to normal and I can get back to living life. 
Well, we really appreciate you taking time to be with us, and we just wish you all the best and that everything works out well for you. So thank you so much, thank Nate. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. Really a pleasure. So thank you. And that is our show. Thank you for joining us. We hope you join us next time on Inside of Healthcare. We'll see you then, everyone.